Thank you very much, Ewan. Now, in the final moments of Barry Rue's re-examination of Oscar Pistorius before the former Paralympian left the stand for the last time, he asked Pistorius to read the contents of the Valentine's Day card that Reva had given him on the night before her, her killing. Now, the last card she would ever write. This is what it contained. This is my Valentine's card, my lady. Yo. Um, excuse me, what, the Valentine's letter and card from Reva. And what, what does it say? Can you read it? It says on the front of the card, roses are red, violets are blue. And then on the inside, she wrote the date on the left. And then on the right, she says, I think today is a good day to tell you that. And then it says, I love you. And then it's, she signed it with her name and a smiley face and some kisses. All right, I want to ask you a very tricky question. And you were at the South African Sports Awards with a specific <laughs> Olympic medalist, uh, Oscar Pistorius. Is anything happening there between you guys? Um, <laughs> he is an amazing man and watch the space I don't know <laughs> thank you so much you've enjoyed your evening thank you so much Wow, now that second clip that we showed you there was an exclusive insight into Reva's feelings about Oscar just three weeks before her tragic passing. Now with us in studio is William Booth, chairperson of the Law Society's Criminal Law Committee to give us his expert summary and findings at this pinnacle point in uh, the case. Now, William, I mean, from what, you, what, what we've seen in terms of that video clip, in terms of the uh, Valentine's Day card, it, one could say, yes, this looks like it was a very, very uh, loving relationship, and whether you want to classify it as love or not, does this change the state's case in, in any way? I mean, crimes of passion between people happen every single day. Does that change things for them? And not necessarily, because the, the state has also presented to court um, certain messages between Reva and Oscar, yes. indicating that they uh, that there were problems and uh, certain ag aggressive tones, as it were, were used, and, and the way they they kind of communicated with each other. So the state was trying to say, look, there was a reason that led up to this incident, and that was that it was an argument that he lost his temper, and that is why he did what he did. Yeah. Now the defence has tried to counter that by saying, well, actually, they were in a loving relationship. So it's like the one saying this, the other saying that. I don't think it's massively significant. Um, although, you know, one doesn't have to prove motive. I mean, people could be in a very loving relationship and something suddenly happens which yeah. causes the one party to lose their temper and then, you know, assault the other or even go as far as killing the other. Yeah. Now, this trial also just hasn't played itself out only in the courtroom itself, but out in the world in terms of social media. People have been saying uh, some of the most uh, craziest things, if I could term it <laughs> that. How careful do people have to be about what they say on social media and the implications of that? I mean, could you say something that could get you into trouble legally by posting your comments, posting your pictures about the trial? Yes, I believe you could, because, you know, the trial is on and, uh, you know, the court has got to make a decision here. Mm. So if people are, are, are posting certain comments, uh, you know, there's a possibility, depending on what they say, yes. that they could find themselves in, in, in some difficulty. And that's why this case is so unique. It's a really a first in criminal justice history, because um, I don't believe any other cases had this kind of exposure, firstly, mm. and secondly, that people are commenting all the time. Yes. You know, those for and those against. They're coming up with all their kind of legal advice and other kind of comments. Uh, it's been a good thing in the sense that the public can see what happens in a court. Yeah. Many people didn't know and they were probably um, unaware of, of, of exactly what takes place in courts, except, you know, here for the first time you have this whole drama which takes place in court taking place uh, on, the, on the public, on the public stage. Sphere, yeah. Do you think this, this, this court case, no matter what the outcome will be, might have an impact on gun control and, and the acts involved in that in South Africa? Well, I think, you know, the, the, the authorities have been looking at gun control because there are a lot of illegal firearms out there and a lot of illegal firearms are used in, in committing crime. Mm -hmm. So and I think here we have a situation that somebody's legally in possession of a firearm and has possibly not behaved responsibly. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the authorities, the lawmakers, uh, the police, all of those involved with gun control need to take a serious look at how can a situation like this be avoided? Because yeah. obviously if Oscar didn't have a firearm, you probably would not have had this tragic 
uh, event. True. William, thank you very much. Always appreciate your time and your insights. William Booth there giving us his expert opinion on the Oscar Pistorius trial. And I think whether it is gun law or whether it's societal interaction, this court case will definitely have uh, an impact on society at large and how we see things going forward afterwards. Now, the defense continues its case again today, and whether Pistorius's fate is sealed or not remains to be seen. You can follow more in-depth analysis of the trial on www.sabcnews.com.